the 317. That is the area code of Indianapolis, Indiana. I've got people over to my left-hand side, which is on the Instagram, but on those of you who are on the IG, it'll actually be your right-hand side because it's switching. It's a little bit backwards. And then also I've got people on the uh, in front of me as well. So one thing, just wanted to check in. Trust you all are well, safe, and healthy during these current times that we're in. And how are you doing? That's one thing I really want to just check in on you guys. Just comment below and let me know how you are feeling because I feel and I've said it on past streams as well that over these past several weeks, I'm going to start waiting for a few more folks to start jumping in here, that it's been very slowed down, but also things have been rapidly changing with everything. So it would mean the world to me, those of you who are on the Facebook in front of me, to do that. those likes, do those loves, those <gasps> Do those wows, I get super jazzed up when I see those. And I had caffeine earlier, so caffeine already on top of my energeticness just really puts me over the top. And also to share the stream so more people can see this, because uh, I'm about to drop absolute bombs and golden nuggets. And thank you everyone over on my left hand, well, it would be your right hand side on the Instagram. Go ahead and hit those uh, hearts as fast as you can. And go proceed to drop where you are from. We are going to do a roll call. I'm here in Indianapolis, Indiana, where you just never know what the weather is going to be. And it's one of those types of things when the news news reporter goes on, he just says, okay, well, later this week, it's going to be 80 degrees. It could be that on Thursday. And then on Friday, it could be below, I wouldn't say below zero, but you could, it literally just shifts in terms of the uh, climates and uh, all of that. So, yeah, comment below. Let me know where you're from. We've got Elaw from Detroit. We've got uh, Ash. Okay, I'm already about to start butchering names. We've got Paige from Seattle. We've got Sarah Simpson. Thanks for joining. We've got Jim the Broker. If I pronounced that correctly too, you, you, you're spelling it a little bit differently. We've got Mindful Money Coaches from Oregon Coast. Uh, gosh, so many awesome people that are on here. You as human beings, I always enjoy doing these streams. And the, today's stream, and if you're just now, those of you on Instagram, my handle is Sterling White Official. One more time, that is Sterling White Official. And yes, I will be dropping those uh, nuggets. So I would say my intention on here is just to give you some lessons uh, from, I had a recent stream this past Sunday and just gave a case study breakdown on my very first multifamily property that I acquired, which was 46 units. So really gave the backstory, gave a case study, and then also went behind the scenes in terms of the numbers. Uh, so now I'm just going to go into the lessons that were learned on that specific deal as well. So go ahead, get your popcorn ready, notes. And if you just happen to be on your phone, one thing I will, I, I will need your full attention. So if you're swiping left or swiping right, swiping right, whether you're on Tinder or some other dating site, let's go ahead and exit out of that so I can have your full focus because you'll definitely uh, want to take notes because I'll be dropping gems. Uh, thanks, Jess Whitley, for joining from Boston. We've got Tanya from uh, Virginia. We've got Jazz, who... Does not, I uh, do not have your name. We got Bill uh, Coll Collier from uh, South Jersey, Xavier from Odom. I mean, Xavier Odom from Houston. We got John from Austin, Texas. So I always appreciate you guys being on these on every Thursday. I come to you 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and on Sundays, the same time. Uh, 3 p.m. or sometimes we'll actually push it a little bit ahead. So don't ever hesitate to reach out and ask any questions. And those of you, I am bald in case you're wondering. So go ahead and put team ball head for those of you who are bald as well. I've actually I suggested that to my little seven-year-old angel who I, the e-learning and the at-home schooling is parents that are here. Let me know how that is going for you. Uh, my little one makes it harder and more difficult than it actually needs to be. So I remember back when I never got homeschooled, but I remember my mom helping me with homework. It was not the greatest experience. And now I can see 
now being a parent, how difficult. So yeah, so let's go ahead and just uh, jump right into things. And if you're wondering who who is this guy that's in uh, in front of me, name is Sterling White uh, on Instagram and is uh, Sterling White Official. Uh, go ahead, someone just tag that below so I can create a tag there. And towards the end, we will have some live Q&A. And those of you who are just jumping in here, uh, we're gonna do live question and answer. And then also at the beginning, just gonna be giving some lessons learned on the very first uh, apartment deal that I was able to acquire, which was 46 units. And yes, we got Xavier Odom, team ball head all day. Love, love the ball because one, I don't have to have a barber. I just, while I'm in the shower, I, I shave my head. I also brush my teeth. I like to be that much more efficient, but let me go ahead. I digress. So born and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, not so good parts of the city. Uh, where you wouldn't want to walk your dog at night or even during the day, fraternal twin brother or single mother, dad wasn't around very much. And just the environment that we were in just was not the greatest. However, decided to not be a product of my environment and use that as fuel. There was just one instance where I remember playing basketball with a friend and then the very next day he lost his life just due to uh, the apartments next door. He attempted to rob the pizza man and the pizza man just happened to be packing and took his life. Uh, so, and it was just another day in the, I would say in essence, the hood. Uh, and it was just, just move on, find another friend. And so through that, got started in real estate in 2009. Things were not going so well in the industry, very similar times to what we are currently facing at this moment and started on construction, fell in love with real estate shortly after, got the investing bug to where I wanted to become more of an investor. And then we got uh, Mr. Ball. We've got someone whose name is Mr. Ball Head on here. That is so hilarious. And he said he's, uh, <laughs> so I'm assuming that you're bald too with the Instagram handle of that. So hilarious. Uh, we've got Gus from Oakland. And so bought very first single family home, 23 years old, 2013, no money out of pocket, shattered all the limiting beliefs that I had that you had to have a large amount of capital to get started. You had to have a, a, quite a bit of experience that it was only for the wealthy. And that very first deal actually had negative funds in my bank account because just not being financially smart. And I was able to get that first deal scaled up to 100 single, 150 uh, single families and made the complete shift to multifamily in 2017. And to date, own just under 400 units and valuation is just under 20 million with that. So if you want more context on myself, I actually wrote a book from zero to 400 units, but that's, uh, I yeah, so that that's if you want more uh, context on my story. But today's topic is just on the lines of, yes, you said ball. <laughs> okay, and yeah, keep on comment below. I would love to hear others' favorite books too, because myself, I'm actually rereading the book E-Myth by Michael Gerber, which is a, a great book. Uh, thanks for the info, friend. Best wishes to you. No, best wishes to you and keep being awesome and uh, stay posit positive, especially during these current times that we're in is myself. I've just input as much positivity as possible and mitigate the negativity uh, and uh, mitigate the news as much as I can, which I, of course, still want to be updated and informed, but at the same time, just not consumed by, which is so easy to be consumed. And I would say way in my early 20s, cutting off the news was one of the first things I did where I really took a different trajectory in life for the better. So now let's go ahead and just jump into the lessons to get everyone caught up. On Sunday, I uh, went into just a case study of the very first apartment deal that I was able to acquire. Uh, and when I say myself, there is a team involved. I was uh, the main person that led the deal with my company and also my partner's company is the two of us. And so with that, made the transition from single family to multifamily, got this deal off market. So went direct to owner, all started with the cold call and did the driving for dollars approach, found a property that needed work, everything's public information. So pull the uh, owner information, it was owned in the LLC, skip trace the LLC and found the person's first and last name and picked up the phone. Uh, and, well, skip trace the person's name 
and was able to find their contact information, then picked up the phone. And so to fast forward, 46 unit deal, was able to get it negotiated to $900,000 purchase price. We're in Indianapolis, so you can get very affordable uh, properties here. Of course, now you can get that property for that much now because prices have definitely gone up. So bought it for 900,000, put 200,000 down to acquire the deal and then raise an additional 685 to take care of improvements uh, from investors to uh, be able to purchase that deal and ended up pushing the rents uh, $75 on a per unit basis. So they were average at, uh, at the time of acquisition. This is working class. Uh, between 550 and 575 and push the rents up to 650 and also a water charge of about 25 to 35 depending I would say uh, 30 30 dollars for the the water charge I'd have to revisit that and dig into that but it was roughly around that and so it ended up going full cycle on that particular deal uh, going in more of a buy and hold however there was just some changes within the business model shifting more to larger assets ended up selling that for 1.85 and ended up getting a good return on investment for partners and also us as a team. So those are all the, the things. There were so many moving parts along uh, with that journey. And that's what I'll go into today, which is the lessons that were learned because there were so many. And one thing that I do want to mention is I'm not perfect by any means. I just do simple experience shares uh, through this as what you would say, a syndicator of multifamily. My uh, criteria now is 75 to 200 unit apartments. That's my uh, that's my go to. And so just through my journey is I often get asked, would you if you were to start over again, would you start with single family? Yes, I would, because I learned so much through that that I was able to apply more to the multifamily. So some of you who are just now getting started may be in a situation to where, well, I hear people out there that says go big or go home. Completely understandable. And yes, if you can do that, that does make sense. However, just from personal experience, if you can start with one deal, maybe you decide that real estate's not even for you or that's when you get your first deal and that's where you really start to get the, the real estate bug and then the rest just snowballs from there. So that's just me providing personal insight of just uh, what I've been seeing with some of the advice out there, of course, to each his own, but that's just one thing I wanna share with you. So going into the first lesson of this deal was, being willing to pivot. Uh, so for the, the longest time is the traditional route with what you would consider commercial because anything above, I believe the threshold is uh, anything above five units or it's four units. I would say five units is considered commercial, even though it's still residential because people are, because it, it's, re it's residents. However, you consider it commercial uh, from a, a technical term. And so through that is, I always thought the route you had to go through brokers in order to be able to find these deals. However, I had brokers that were sending sending these deals over and they were just not uh, penciling out. Did you put yours uh, 200K down? Uh, yes, uh, originally, and then brought in investors to put the 200K down and then did a co-investment of about $50,000 with the investor partner. So pulled the original 200K that was put down from both my partner and I, and that was private money that was used for the 200K and then raised from investor partners to be able to replace that so we could use that as operating capital as a company. And so the, to go back is willing, willing to pivot. Brokers were sending over deals. They were just not penciling out. So instead of just saying on the sidelines, I'm just going to wait for a correction to happen for the, the times to be able to uh, get better so I can be able to, to, to buy deals, especially in the multifamily and things were heating up. I decided, OK, how can I pivot to, in essence, get still get these deals, but in, in at the end of the day, beat the brokers to the punch. Uh, so from that, I decided to go the direct to owner approach, still nurture those relationships with brokers, but just give you all a prime example. There was a, a 80, 84 unit that's, it was, it was between 80 and 90 units. This was about several months ago, broker sent the deal over and stretching for our team just under $6 million for the purchase price. And they ended up selling that 
near eight and a half million, or that's what he had indicated. This you're not even within range. This will sell for around eight and a half. So it's just just give you some context in terms of just how far uh, it it is in terms of things that are listed and what people are actually willing to pay. So decided to take the approach to go direct to the owner. So in essence, being willing to pivot upon what feedback you're getting from the marketplace. So uh, that's one thing. And uh, there's so many pivots that you can make. And it's just not even on acquisitions. It's just being an entrepreneur itself, especially these current times that we're in, being willing to make the necessary pivots and adjustment based upon what the marketplace is giving you. Meaning, prime example, with the uh, apartments that I have, I'm actually in one right now that I have, which is the 80 unit, that as soon as the lockdown essentially ended up happening uh, and people were losing their jobs, of course, there's a stimulus check that the on-site staff started getting and someone says, where did you find investors? Uh, I would say across the country. And a lot of what I did was uh, the personal branding. However, starting with your power base, which is your friends, your friends of friends, your family, your family's friends. That's where the start and then start and then to branch out from there. And I forgot where I tend to do that. Forgot where my thought process was when I was talking about willing to pivot. Oh, what the team is, as soon as the lockdown and all that is getting ahead in terms of uh, over communicating with the residents and letting and saying, if you end up paying early, you will end up getting $25 off your next month's rent. Uh, in addition to that, is that uh, those if you send someone to us, we will double the referral bonus. Uh, the operations had to shut down in the specific office for residents and prospective residents to come in. So those are necessary pivots and adjustments to to make. Uh, and one thing that I've just learned and from others is being willing to accept what is going on. And when you accept it, then from that, that meaning things have officially hit the fan and that I need to buckle down and start going more all in. And I'm going to, let's say it takes 175 to 200, uh, what is it, properties that you look at in order to find one that works, which is generally where I'm at, that you may have to even double that. So, and right now the financing side is very uh, difficult right now in terms of acquisitions. I'm still in acquisitions mode. However, the financing piece is the most difficult right now in today's climate. So, being willing to pivot. That's the first lesson that was learned on that 46 unit is going direct to owner because the route of the brokers was just not working. Second is that sales is everything. This is a huge unlock for me personally. And what I mean, sales is everything is not, it doesn't even apply to business itself. It even applies to outside of business. And I'll give you a, a prime example. I keep going to my seven year old little angel that's got hair all the way down to her back like Tarzan that just recently she sold me on why she wants on to stay up. I wanted her to go to bed at a specific time. She sold me on staying up uh, to where she just kept grinding me down. I said, all right, you can go ahead and stay up. Okay. She sold me. That was her, that was her approach. And so that is sales is everything and it's not just in business itself. And so just going back to when it on the acquisition side is even though when you are buying, you are selling. Uh, so with that, let me go ahead and see uh, the seller when going direct with them, sold him on why we are the right buyers for the deal because had no multifamily experience, but was able to leverage the single family home experience. So that's one thing on why he was able to, to go with us. And the first thing that he mentioned as soon as we were on the call is that if you are not willing to put down $50,000 earnest money, then this conversation does not uh, need to continue. So I had to sell him on. The overcoming that and what you said ended up getting the earnest money either way. Uh, but those are all the types of things to overcome. And then secondly, was able to negotiate the seller financing, meaning that for him to carry back $700,000 and for us to put down 200 and one, he was, uh, the, the owner was motivated. However, he did not have to go that route. He could have went with someone who was willing to pay cash or still able to get some financing and just cash him out entirely. So I had to sell him on the occupancy is 60%. There's no way that we're going to be able to get financing. 
And so with that, would you be willing to carry back uh, $700 or carry back a portion of the loan he went for? And we had to sell him that in three years, we would be able to cash him out uh, in essence through either a refinance or just selling the property, but ended up selling the property to a 1031 buyer. So that's what I really want. Uh, if you get anything away from this, uh, if you uh, sales is everything. And those of you on Facebook, if you give those likes, those <gasps> Those wows, those ahas, and those loves greatly appreciate it. And then also sharing would mean the world to me. And then those of you who are on my right hand side, it's actually technically my left, but I'm looking at it uh, backwards, is just go ahead and tap those hearts as fast as you can. I love seeing those. Okay. And the third point is relationships are everything. So when speaking with this specific owner, did not make it so much of a transactional basis was more of forming a relationship with that person. And what I mean by relationship was one thing that, but when both my partner and I went and met, met with them, and this is a ninja trick I always use, and I wouldn't even call it a trick, it's just a little strategy. I always bring a thank you card with me. And it just says a small note that, hey, thank you for your time. Uh, looking forward to working with you on this transaction. A simple card like that. And I believe it's one of those reciprocity, if I pronounce that word correctly, that you give, uh, yes, someone, uh, Ken says, uh, there is always a way. I totally agree that agree with that. And this goes into mindset. And this is when I would say personally, when people reach out to me, I believe you can know all the strategies, the techniques, the 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 insights that what it takes to be able to buy a deal, scale your portfolio, et cetera. However, if you don't have the right mindset, then none of that matters. That's just me speaking from a, a personal uh, opinion. Uh, of course, but when I started with, especially when I changed the complete trajectory of my life, really started on self-improvement, Earl Nightingale was one person that really paved the way in terms of giving me more empowering beliefs and replacing those limiting beliefs, which I know I still have limiting beliefs to this day, and it's about me. And this is one thing I'm, I'm always constantly wanting to become more self-aware, that when I do have a limiting belief, that as soon as it happens, I catch it like, oh crap, that's a limiting belief. Let me let me figure out let me figure out a way to do or overcome exactly what that is. Meaning, let's say an abundance versus a scarcity mindset. That let's say I'm in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, looking to buy deals. That let's say uh, right now the market's too hot. Uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to buy deals. There's just not enough. That would be one of those. Boom. That's a limiting belief. Let me replace that with more of an empowering one so I can start to ask the right questions of how can I go about uh, finding deals in today's climate uh, wh where I zig where other people are zagging or zag where other people are zigging. You guys get where I'm going. Just that That's where I believe it always starts is the, the mental side and the, the mindset because it's just being an operator is tough. No one sees the behind the scenes. Okay, I don't want to go into this huge tangent, but many people see the, the highlight. Oh, he closed 156 unit deal, but they don't see all of that work that really led up to those points. So I really did just want to uh, share, share that all with you. It's not very glamorous by any means. There's a lot of things that I, myself personally, I even still do to this day that I don't enjoy so much. But I have what is my why that I'm ultimately working towards and to be able to get me through those times. So just going back to relationship is everything and not making it so transactional. So met with the seller and was able to share stories. And one thing was he was shifting from being a operator of multifamily. This was his very last one that he was selling to shift more to. Uh, being a debt collector to go after the people that are actually behind on rent, interesting enough. So that was his story. We were able to share that and just made it more relationship based. And that has always worked for me when going off market and direct to owners. And that is how I have personally acquired all of the, the deals I have is strictly off market. And it starts with relationship because a lot of times these people are not even in the market to sell or raising their hand. And those of you on Instagram, today's topic is live uh, Q and A towards the end, and I'm also giving lessons on the very first 46 unit multifamily that I acquired. This was three years ago. Time is just really going super fast, 
And you'll find that since you're not able to find it on Instagram, you, you can visit uh, the Bigger Pockets uh, Facebook page. So relationships. The fourth uh, point is to expect the unexpected. And those of you, go ahead and comment with your favorite books below. Uh, one of mine is Think and Grow Rich. That's always a staple uh, and a staple in terms of like the, the foundational books. Another is Maverick Mindset by Doug, uh, Doug Hall. That's a good book too. Uh, so the, the fourth point is expect the unexpected. And so one thing that happened with this specific deal, 46 units, is that the rehab ended up taking longer than expected. So when closed on it, the winter was not, what was a hor horrific winter. It was not a good winter by any means. Uh, so with that, had difficulties doing certain jobs that needed to be done just due to the weather was too cold. Uh, weren't able to get contra contractors out there. Uh, so there was those moving parts, which in essence, when you have a, a specific schedule that you're going after that and you say that your occupancy is going to be at 80%, uh, let's say in June, and that you've been able to push up the rents. And if you're not able to get through those renovations and you've promised your investors these specific terms, returns starting this time, then everything just ends up getting pushed and pushed and pushed because there has been a delay on things. So uh, either way, through the exit, ended up uh, getting partners and ourselves a, a, a great return. But what I mean in this particular case is expect the unexpected, because there is always going to be something that happens. So to not, uh, what is it, underestimate the rehab, always have some type of buffer, meaning that if your estimated rehab is let's say 100,000 or let's say 1 million, or I'll just use something more recent, 100,000, then to create a little bit more of a miscellaneous buffer of, let's say, uh, throw on 20,000 or uh, 50,000 on top of that, especially if it's an older property. Uh, Maverick Mindset is by Doug Hall. That is uh, that individual. And uh, also I mentioned about the terrible uh, winter and then the boiler had some difficulties with the boiler system. I do not like properties with boilers. I prefer myself personally all electric and just had ongoing issues with one and ended up having to replace it, which was not in the original assumptions. Uh, either way, just ended up, that's why it's always good on the front end to have that buffer in there of, okay, if it's $100,000 is your expected rehab to put more on top of that for unexpected items and to raise enough. So if the deal is tight, meaning that uh, you can only make the deal work with a $100,000 rehab, then that's where you could, that, that is just really uh, in terms of just from personal experience, a slippery slope. Uh, so if you're cutting it close on the rehab and then also uh, your return on investment or however you uh, underwrite your deal and you don't have that buffer for the unexpected, then once that unexpected happens, then you just really ate into whatever your cash flow is. So um, we've got Recession Proof by Jay Scott is a recommended book. And I know that is on biggerpox.com. Uh, Jay Scott is a great person, met him. Uh, and the fourth and final point is better ROI on time. And what I mean by better return on investment on time is I purchased 40, I purchased 46 single family homes in one 46 unit apartment that it. It is one, a lot more management intensive to purchase 46 individual uh, homes. And also from a management standpoint, it's very difficult uh, versus with the 46. Uh, so the 46 single family homes, a lot of these were one offs, uh, may get a package of two, may get a package of three. So the transactions was 35 to 40 separate transactions. Uh, for that. So there's direct mail. There's all these multiple calls that are coming in, calls going out, bandit signs, all this types of uh, marketing to get that deal flow in. And then on the multifamily, it's one buyer, one transaction, 46 individual units all in one location. So that's just what I wanted to uh, go ahead and share with someone. So just to go ahead and give a refresher and take it all full circle. And I know I really just went dropped right into the content for you all is one be willing to pivot. The second is sales is everything. 
Uh, the third is relationships that really helps you get the upper hand, especially over other competitors. The fourth is expect the unexpected. And with that, to have a buffer within your underwriting and financials for that. And then the fifth is better ROI on time. And ROI is return on investment on time because when you're in, this is another thing is it depends on where you're looking to go with your specific portfolio because someone may be able to be financially free with five units, 10 units. Uh, myself personally, I'd rather grow and have a larger portfolio, but to eat, that's more in the eye of the beholder. So, beholder. so that's why I'm just doing my experience share there. All right. And someone says question here by Will uh, Galmeyer, you mean all electric like heat pumps? Either way, how does energy efficient factor into your pro uh, process? And what I mean by all electric units is that there's they are ran by electricity, meaning that there's no gas stove or there's no gas furnace. Everything is just all electric. So there's no like the boilers are what run the heat, and that is get that is gas heat versus all electric is completely uh, completely separate. And normally that the residents just have one bill uh, with that. And then of course there's the water charge, but don't wanna go too much into the, the little nuances, but just from a efficiency standpoint, all electric is much better versus gas and electric. All right, how do you recommend getting into this uh, question by Mary Anu? How do you recommend getting into multifamily as a beginner? If you can find a mentor, uh, that would help, especially it would speed up your learning curve. And in addition, if you're not able to find a mentor, that's always the best way uh, to go. Myself personally, that's how I got my foot in the door on the single family side was uh, work for a mentor for completely free. Yes, I did say free. Some people were like, what, how do you work for free? I was actually at, at that time living in my friend's den. So my overhead in terms of expenses was very low. It's even still today. Uh, Cause as you can say, I'm a minimalist. Literally, when, when, I tra uh, when I traveled to Dubai, this was a week and that was absolute uh, dream of mine. I traveled with one backpack. Yes, I'm a minimalist. You move, you uh, go into where I live. It looks like I just moved in. Uh, so I even still live that day to just over. I'm, I'm just a simple person, a simple guy. And so that helped with me living in my friend's den that I had low overhead to where I was able to uh, be willing to forego being able to get paid to bring that value to that mentor on the other side. Because that was the, the kicker when I sat down with them. I said, I'm willing to, uh, what is it that you need help in your business? Here's the kick. You don't have to pay me anything. And took me on on that. All right. I live in California where it's expensive. Do you suggest new investors invest in another state? I would say invest as close to home as you can. Uh, however, if it, the numbers just do not absolutely work out, then that's when you can start to venture out a little bit more, maybe to the Midwest uh, or to markets that are even more affordable. But uh, on that same note, stay as close as you uh, to, to home as you can. There may be a, a tertiary market or a market that's an hour 45, two hours to where you can find uh, properties that are a little bit more affordable. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Is it possible for a newbie to do commercial real estate investing? I was told it is only possible if you start with residential and then switch to commercial. No, you can go direct uh, to commercial uh, real estate investing. And that depends when you say commercial real estate investing, do you mean investing passively or you would be the general partner. So the one that is operating the deal itself. So uh, either way you can get, get started. It's just about, it's preferable that once you make the transition to commercial that, and this goes back to the, the, the thing that I mentioned a little bit earlier is uh, if you can find a mentor who's been there, done that, and then learn from that person that allow you to have the necessary ammunition and the experience and knowledge to be able to venture out on your own. Of course, you'll still make your own mistakes, uh, but it'll mitigate your risk as much as possible. Uh, someone did ask about there is a Indianapolis grading map that, and that, that question was from uh, Mary. Yeah. So great question. Someone asked about a Indianapolis map that I put up. Uh, this was 
several years ago, so it definitely needs some updating. Yes, I will be updating that and I do have a call with an individual. So we're working through the logistics of that with just collaborating of what, what neighborhoods are more up and coming, which ones are still war zones and uh, which ones are have become even more affluent uh, to upgrade that map. Because I know quite a bit of people have been using that. And yes, Mara, Mar Marie, or M Maria was referring to General Parker. So hopefully that did provide some context to you. All right, she's gonna answer some your branding through social media by her, same question as well, Maria. And that's uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that name correctly. It's uh, spelled differently. And yes, your branding is not only I use a, quite a bit of digital, but also I use uh, offline too with being speaker at events, attending local meetups, but primarily was digital. Uh, and what I leveraged was one, biggerpockets.com. It's been a phenomenal in terms of the collaboration, being a contributor. So that's one path to bring on investors and then also the branding aspect and then having my own podcast. That's one, uh, that's another route. And then being on others podcasts. So it's all about, and this goes back to one book that was an absolute game changer for me was Jab, Jab, Right Hook by Gary Vaynerchuk. I use that exact principle in terms of give, 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 and then uh, that's the jabs. And then the right hook is, hey, invest with me, purchase my coaching or whatever, along whatever your services is, uh, whatever your services are. Uh, so in essence, the path that I took is just to give out a lot of value. And uh, a lot of times you don't even have to go for the ask or the right hook. Uh, so I would start with that, uh, start with that book. And then also I do leverage social media more, even more now especially LinkedIn today, their algorithm is, and I, I'm going into some uh, tactical things, posting content, especially video content, you will get a lot of reach versus on Instagram and Facebook, which Facebook owns Instagram. You post a piece of content, you have to pay in order to get uh, more people to see it versus on LinkedIn, they're pushing it out even more. Uh, so there's that. And another question that we have here, I'm trying to scroll all the way at the top. All right. So we're just going to answer a few more questions that we have here. Uh, I live in St. Louis, another Midwest market. How did you create your map with neighborhoods of interest to you? Uh, the So I use data and then also personal insights from living in the market. When you're creating these types of maps, there's so many different ways that you can go with using data sources, using personal insights, using others' insights. Uh, so I putting it together a lot of my own personal opinion just from being born and raised in this market and i know that i definitely was able to get the war zones uh correct because a lot of those war zones are not so good areas i grew up in so i know i got the context definitely right on that and then the working class settings i got and once you push out to the suburbs here in indianapolis that's where things are even more stable like in most markets suburbs are you can't go wrong with those i know they may be different in some markets but predominantly suburbs are uh pretty stable uh investment so we're just going to go ahead and answer a few more uh questions that are here two more uh one is are you a wholesaler no i am not I buy the properties from my own personal portfolio. What fee does the principal make as a general partner? Uh, that is that is very open in terms of uh, how, it, it depends on how you structure the deal. Some, some principals or general partners don't charge any fees up front, they just take more equity. Some end up charging fees up front. It really does uh, vary up on the deal and how you can in essence sell that to your partners but at the end of the day it's just about giving them enough return on their investment to where they'll keep coming along uh so it you in essence reverse engineer let's say you want to get your partners double digit returns cash on cash and then also their internal rate returns so doubling their money then that will allow you to back into what you what equity you can retain and what fees that you can charge uh, especially on the upfront end. We will go ahead and answer one question. Thanks for answering my question. I came in late, so I am unfamiliar with you. Uh, thanks, Jay Holly. So yes, born, uh, just owned under uh, 400 units, got started in the industry. This was uh, 2009, contributing for Bigger Pockets. It's about five or six years now, or maybe like five or four. 
Time is flying, so I have no idea even more. Oh, I did pronounce that uh, right, Maria. Okay. How are you investing in multifamily in Indy? I heard most multifamily in Indianapolis are usually in rough neighborhoods. Uh, when you, I would say the smaller multifamily, yes, are in rough neighborhoods, but they're scattered throughout the city. I mean, in the suburbs, they've been built throughout. So, all right. And we're going to go ahead and answer one more question. How do you compete with large scale companies? Uh, so targeting more mom and pop, I would say my sweet spot, what I mentioned earlier is 75 to 200 units. However, the, the real sweet spot is between 75 to about 125 and well, actually 75 to 150. A lot of that size is just too small for those operators and minimal. They want larger deals than that. So I would say I'm within the range of operators such as uh, myself. So not dealing with the larger organizations because they're wanting to buy uh, larger assets to really get economies of scale to where it makes sense for them. So that's what I would say. And I'm targeting more of the mom and pop operators where it's more distressed and more hands on in terms of the construction, the management. So a lot of those large, I wouldn't say a lot of those large companies, but some companies are not willing to take on that risk and that much uh, rehab with the heavy lifting. They would more so want to be willing to pay a little bit more for something that's a little bit more stabilized and someone has already taken on that risk and put in those necessary renovations and now they come in they essentially pay for all that work that that person's done and pay a little bit more so i do appreciate everyone uh, for being on here i will uh this upcoming sunday be on the stream as well so don't ever hesitate to reach out with any questions. Those of you on Instagram, go ahead and slide into the DM if I can be of assistance to you. And the Instagram handle is Sterling White Official. That is Sterling White Official. So keep being awesome, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. All right. Okay, okay. Have a great one, everyone.